Russia is a relatively young country with a long history. This largest nation in the world has undergone tremendous changes in the last 20 years to become one of the fastest developing entities in the world today. Not only has Russia taken a lead in recovering from the global financial crisis, she has launched a new series of social and economic reforms. Evolution of Russia, a series of four episodes, will be exploring how these reforms have affected the global economy, such as how Russian enterprises have to face up to worldwide challenges in an open competition, the prospects and opportunities prompted by the visions of today's new generation of Russians, how Sino-Russian collaboration has created new opportunities for both countries. In this first episode, we will take a look at how Russia has repeatedly seized the opportunities of change. Moscow is the capital of Russia. It's an important political and economic hub of the country and the most populated city in Europe. In the summer of 2010, while Europe was still struggling to recover from the 2008 global financial tsunami, Russia's economy was already on the rebound. The construction of Moscow City, which will become the tallest building in Europe, has now resumed after a two-year halt. The stock market has also recovered and consumer confidence has been restored. Sapsan, the rapid train between Moscow and St. Petersburg, was back on track in 2009, linking the two most important cities in Russia. These all reflect that the Russian economy has bottomed out of the financial tsunami. Russia has survived decades of chaos, from the 80s when the former Soviet Union tried to carry out economic reforms, to after its disintegration in the early 90s, when the country started to move towards an open economy. But after a new series of economic and social reforms, Russia has now emerged as one of the fastest developing countries in the world. Comparatively speaking, the 2008 financial tsunami was but a brief interlude in Russia's last 20 years of evolution. We live in paradise. And people, what do you mean? I mean, are you crazy? This is such a difficult place. Like, no, no, in paradise compared to last year. Born in Venezuela, Rostislav opened the first foreign restaurant in the former Soviet Union. Today he owns the largest catering group in Russia. He's witnessed Russia's development in the last 20 years. Half Russian with full capabilities of the language, he was invited to visit his motherland for the first time in 1984 to participate in an exhibition. Under the communist regime, Rostislav could not find a single restaurant that served foreigners nor could he buy any film to take photographs. After returning to Venezuela, he started to contact multinationals and to make plans to introduce the film developing and restaurant businesses to the Russian market. In 1984, I understood that there was a market, a huge market that was not served. And then, two years later, Gorbachev came to power, Perestroika started, and he opened the first opportunity for joint ventures between foreigners and Soviet entities. And I had already two years ahead of everybody because I had this idea already in mind. At that time, Russia was trying to turn the depressed economy around by carrying out reforms to allow foreign enterprises into the country. This enabled Rostislav to realize his plan. As there were no other competitors, his restaurant and film developing businesses were most welcome. The disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991 led to a quick privatization of state enterprises. Some people became rich instantly, while consumer power surged. This enabled Rostislav's restaurant business to expand. From then till 1997, his business turnover increased by 30% annually. However, the changing circumstance did not benefit every Russian.
St. Petersburg, known as Leningrad during the Soviet Union era in memory of Lenin, one of the founders, has long been a renowned scientific, artistic and cultural centre in Europe. Pavia, who was born in St. Petersburg, started piano lessons when he was seven. He later attended musical school and became a member of the St. Petersburg Orchestra. In the 90s, Russia carried out a series of aggressive reforms. State enterprises were privatized overnight, leading to a rapid depreciation of the ruble. A drop in consumer power, shortage of materials, and social and economic chaos. Under these circumstances, Pavio and his wife Ina could hardly envisage what their future might be. We wanted to have children, but we couldn't afford to. We felt that it would take a long time before Russia could offer an appropriate environment for us to rear a child. That's when we decided to move abroad. In 1997, Pavia was invited to join the South American Ecuador Orchestra. He and his wife decided to accept the offer and leave their home country. They did not imagine then that they would ever return. Let me tell you honestly how I felt that moment when I was about to leave my country. I was in Amsterdam waiting for a flight transfer to Latin America. It was most embarrassing for a man like me to be on the verge of tears for some six hours, crying for my country. I would imagine that Russia was like a spring that was compressed for many years. And here, the political spring was suddenly released, but not like this, it was just released. And it started going like this and like this. And if you were on one of the extremes, you would be hit and you would be killed. And when you first leave a spring that is compressed, it goes very fast. Too, 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 too. So that was the 90s. Too, 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 too. Eh? Russia was deeply affected by the Asian financial crisis in late 1997. Foreign enterprises started to leave the country. The economy took a further plunge in 1998 when international speculators hit the ruble, causing it to depreciate by 74%. Shops started to use US dollars as a clearing unit. Inflation surged and the Russian economy was on the brink of collapse. Rostislav's flourishing restaurant business was also gravely affected and he lost 80% of his asset overnight. All the salaries are paid in dollars. All your supplies are paid and your debt is in dollars. The banks, you own to the bank $10 million, $10 million. We had to fire 1,000 people in a month of a force of maybe 3,000 or 4,000. It was very painful. In December 1999, Boris Yeltsin suddenly resigned and he was replaced by Putin as vice president. Putin immediately embarked on restoring economic order by introducing a series of asset, financial, legal, taxation, political, social and economic reforms. This brought stability and continual improvement to gross national productivity. But Russia was hit once again by a global financial tsunami in September 2008 which resulted in a shortage of capital, drop in exports, tightening of bank credits, and a deflation of 7.9%, the first in 10 years. People did lose jobs. The production in certain industrial areas was obviously down, but I think Russia recovered very fast compared to other developed economies. Russia suffered to a lesser extent for different reasons. A, because Russia was cash positive. It had a lot of cash pretty much on hand. Russian's producers remain at the bottom of the cost curve, which helps a lot because this way Russians can, could continue exporting stuff, which allowed a lot of Russian enterprises to maintain jobs. Russia has a relatively small population of 140 million in comparison to its large area of 17 million square kilometers. That's almost 1.8 times the size of China. Its vast territory offers rich natural resources such as natural gas, oil, wood and metals. Since the 1998 financial crisis, Russia had depended largely on the export of natural resources to revive the nation's economy. The government even set aside a special reserve of foreign exchanges earned from such exports. It was this reserve that helped Russia to rebound from the 2008 financial tsunami. The government was trying to 
improve the situation by stimulating uh, both uh, consumption and um, investment uh, spending and also by supporting Russian banks uh, so that uh, no uh, collapse of the financial system will unfold due to the large share of uh, non-performing uh, loans. By 2010, we were able to stabilize uh, economic situation, stabilize consumption. In 2010, uh, forecast is 4% uh, growth. The 2008 financial tsunami was a test on Russia's resilience. It also revealed the country's overdependence on the export of natural resources, the weak economic structure, and the need for economic and social reforms. We should think about the future, think about the strategy to diversify the Russian economy and promote innovations so that uh, it will not rely uh, as uh, much as before uh, on uh, natural, resource, uh, natural resources and commodity exports in general. In 2002, Pavio, who was once disappointed with the country, decided to return to his motherland with his wife and South American-born son. This time we managed to save some money before we returned to Russia to start all over again. But many things had changed in those five years. We couldn't recognize our own country anymore. It was so different from the time we left the country. Having witnessed how Russia has rebounded from the financial crisis, Pavio is now more confident about the future. We believe under the current circumstances, we have the capabilities and resources to take care of our children and to provide them with a good education. I have no doubt about this. Russia is now at a crossroads, and it came to this crossroads well prepared, uh, which is very different from how Russia came to the crisis in 98.